Hello everybody, my name is Wojta Repa and I'm here to give you a general overview of RFID tags. So let's start. So what is an RFID tag? RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. It is a tag that allows people to track something and it's used when dealing with great quantity of items to uniquely identify a specific item. It comes in various shapes and sizes depending on the application it's used for. So in here we could see that RFIDs um, are tagging a bunch of different palettes. Each palette needs to be uniquely identified to know what's inside that palette and that just makes it easier when dealing with such a great quantity of items. This cow also has a RFID tag inside its ear and it's used to uh, uniquely identify this cow. This key also has a unique, um, unique, unique identification tag inside of it, and it allows it to um, operate the specific car, and no other key can be used to do that. This runner also has a RFID tag on his shoe, actually, um, and it's used when hundreds of runners uh, are racing, and a specific runner needs to be identified, basically. Um, a little bit more general info. Um, RFID tags are actually a relatively new implemented technology, even though they have been around for a while. But it, we have all come in contact with them wi without even knowing it. RFIDs are actually similar to barcodes, but actually they're better. RFID tags are resistant to dirt, heat, paint solvents, and other materials. This gives them an advantage over barcodes that can be torn, dirtied, or removed during a transit. RFIDs can be automatic, uh, are, can be autom automatically identified at a distance, and there is no line of sight required for them to be read. So, how did I hear about RFID tags? Well, I've heard about them in Dr. Silverman's class called Computer Organizations. RFIDs are, have actually quickly caught my eye in that class. Um, Dr. Silverman gave me a brief overview of what RFID tags are, and he also described some applications that RF RFID tags take on. I have then discovered that I have been using RFIDs without even knowing them, without even knowing it. And actually, I bet you have too. So here we can see how a specific RFID tag is placed inside this Visa card. And this little symbol over here on the card um, actually says that it's RFID capable. And this RFID um, can be can or basically takes on this number inside this visa card and transmits it transmits it to this receiver of this vi on this visa card reader and basically sends the information over so it can pay for whatever you bought also it is used in events in wristbands so the event coordinator can actually keep track of people that are going in also, it is used uh, in library books where a library custodian uh, needs to be aware if the book is checked out or not, or maybe if the book is stolen, um, then readers are placed at the exit, and those reader if um, the book is stolen, then the beeping noise will go off. So lots of different applications. But let me give you a general overview of where I'm headed with this presentation. I will be giving a general overview of RFID tags. I'll first describe the system of what's needed to be included to make a RFID work. Then I'll go into the history of RFID tags and describe where they came from, basically. Then I'll head into where RFID um, I'll compare an RFID with other forms of um, labeling, such as the barcodes. Then I'll get into how the switch was the switch was made from those barcodes and other forms of labeling to RFIDs that are 
more used now and then I look at some different types of tags RFID tags then I'll describe how they work and what they are comprised of and in this I look at some advantages and problems that we've been having with RFID tags and then I look at where some of the different um, forms and uses of RFID tags and the applications and their applications in the world and then I'll see where RFID tags are going in the future and look at some other um, uses we still have and are finding for them um, st still and then I will conclude my presentation so let's get into it here is the system that's needed um, in order for an RFID tag to operate it is a four-part system that's consist that consists of the tag or the transporter the reader um, also ha that has a, also has an antenna then the hosts or the dat database and also the data collection application that actually would be C right here um, that makes the reader communicate with the database so here is the tag or the transporter and this communicates with the antenna of the reader and they go back and forth transmit the unique ID back and forth then this reader forwards that to the data collection application and the data collection application then feeds it to the host or the database where all that information is stored so now let's look at the history of RFID tags actually um, the first application of RFIDs was seen in World War II it was used instead of a radar to identify aircrafts um, this was in the form of IFF um, also known as identity friendly or foe um, RFIDs were put in use when they were proposed in 1969 by Mario Cardulo uh, pictured over here they were then approved to use in the public in 1973 uh, the second use was actually in Los Alamos National Laboratories there their purpose was serving as security and RFIDs were placed in entrance passes to secure areas so as you could see here if the chips ID matched the ID in the database then the entrance was granted basically so here is um, the Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, in 1973 there were however some problems um, in the beginning so RFIDs were unable to make a great impact in the world until the computer systems were developed enough to where RFIDs would work efficiently with them. The computers had to be fast enough to read each tag and search it in the database as well as have enough storage to keep information for hundreds of thousands of tags and th their ID numbers and the information associated with those numbers. The cost of RFIDs has also gone down to an acceptable cost for businesses to buy it, which has also been a turnoff for computers at first. Their range was also not very good at first, so they had, that they had to be very close with, uh, with the reader in order for them to be detected. So as you can see here, at first, the RFID tag label cost was very high, and then as the years went on the cost decreased and their performance was very low at first but as the years went on the performance increased so this was really really great for RFIDs and this is where the switch happened in 1990 finally in the 1990s businesses farmers and the government have slowly begun to make the switch from barcodes to RFID tags some previous problems were fixed and RFIDs were improved. Their uses, their uses are rapidly growing and more and more applications are being found for them today. 
So RFIDs in comparison to barcodes, let's look at that. RFIDs are actually an alter alternative way of labeling. RFIDs are much better than labels, barcodes, and optical co codes. Why? Well, it's because they are much smaller, they can be hidden and molded, there is no line of sight that is needed to read them, they also support larger ID numbers, you can also detect many at once, which is c very convenient, um, whereas when barcodes have to be individually scanned. And they're also becoming much cheaper to use as the amount of use goes up. So let's look at some more comparisons uh, between barcodes and RFID tags. So barcodes have to have require a line of sight to be read, whereas RFID tags can be read without a line of sight. Barcodes can only be read individually, whereas RFIDs um, can be read multiple can read multiple tags. Um, they can multiple tags can be read at once with RFIDs. With barcodes, um, they barcodes can't read can be read if they're damaged or dirty, whereas RFIDs can cope with harsh or dirty environments. Barcodes can only be identified can only identify the type of item, whereas RFIDs can identify a specific item. Uh, barcodes cannot be updated, whereas RFIDs have new information that can be overwritten on them. And, and barcodes require manual tracking, and therefore they're susceptible to human error, whereas RFIDs can be automatically tracked, removing that human error. So now let's look at some different types of tags. Um, we are we use electromagnetic or ele electronic tagging to uniquely identify each tag and what that what that tag belongs to. Electronic tagging can be divided into two types of tags. Here we have the, uh, the active tags, which require a power source to operate, as pictured here. Here's a battery or something that powers this RFID tag. And then we have passive tags that don't need this power source. So let's look at the difference between the two. Active tags require a form of power source attached to the tag, and they include more electronics as well. This makes them much bigger in size and heavier, but it also increases their range at the same time. Some of the uses, um, they're used any times, anytime a tag is very far away from the reader, which gives it more range, basically. Um, so, for example, on aircrafts, they're uniquely identified, identify the aircraft's origin, as pictured here. They're also used in low jack devices attached to cars that incorporate cel cellular technology along with global positioning systems, also known as GPS, if a car is stolen, basically. Okay, so now let me get into how passive tags work. Passive tags don't require a power source um, because they are close, they're close enough to the reader where they can get their power from the reader wirelessly using an interrogation signal. This makes them much smaller and convenient in size and lighter in weight as well. Some of the uses are ti uh, chip timing, grocery stores, credit cards, library books, and many more. Um, anytime a chip is closed to a reader is when RFID tags are used. Um, they last uh, their lifetime, they last forever. They are cheap in bulks. Their range, however, decreases as a result. This is one of the downsides. There are also two different types of passive tags. There is near field coupling and far field coupling. So let me go over some differences between active RFID tags and passive RFID tags real quick. Their communication range. Active tags can communicate from long ranges of 100 meters to, mo to more and passive tags have a short range of about three meters or less. Ac active tags, um, they have some multi-tagging 
capabilities. Um, RFID tags, um, they can tag, they can collect up to hundreds of tags over seven acre region from a single reader. And they can collect 20 tags moving at more than 100 miles an hour. Whereas passive tags, they can collect up to a few hundred tags within three meters from a single reader. Uh, they can collect 20 tags moving at three miles an hour or slower. So much slower for the passive tags than the active tags. Then the sensor capabilities. For active tags, the ability to continuously monitor and record sensor input data and time stamp for each event. And passive tags, they have the ability to read and transfer um, sensor values only when tags are powered by reader and no da they don't have a date and timestamp. Also for active tags, the data storage. Let's look at the data storage. Their data storage are, is a large read and write data storage, 128 gigabytes, kilobytes with sophisticated data search and access capabilities are available. Whereas passive RFID tags have a small read and write data storage and they only have about 128 uh, bytes of storage. Um, some more differences between these two are that active tags, they also have area monitor monitoring, whereas passive tags don't. Active tags have spot level locating with dual range active activation, whereas passive tags also have that except it's a little bit slower, uh, lower frequencies are used. Um, for active tags, they also have um, high speed multi-tag portal. Um, this allows them for, for hundreds of tags to be act, um, read basically at more than 60 miles an hour. Um, also sm smaller portals require dual range act activation and the passive tags are limited to about five to ten tags and less than 10 miles an hour basically for them to be read um, also cargo security applications active tags are sophisticated whereas passive tags are really simple um, active tags and they have magnif um, electromagnifest Magnifest, whereas passive tags do not, and active tags, and let's see, active tags and business process impacts, they they have minimal impacts for businesses, um, whereas passive tags actually have a lot of impacts in businesses, and active tags, let's look at active tags and their application characteristics. Um, they have dynamic business process. Um, they also have un unconstrained asset movement. They have security and sensing. They also have data storage and logging. So whereas passive tags, they have rigid business process and constrained asset uh, movement. And they have very simple security sensing and limit limited data storage. So I think that's enough differences between active tags and passive tags. So now let's look at um, what each tag actually contains. So an RFID chip, also known as a tag or a transporter, same thing, they are made of an antenna in a form of either a coil or, or a dipole to receive power from the reader and transmit the unique ID to, um, it possesses. So as you can see, here is the antenna coil, coiled around the RFID tag and it trans transmits information to the reader, as I said, uh, using radio waves. Then we have the chip in here, wi which actually stores, it holds information about the physical object um, in which the tag is attached to. So this actually stores the unique RFID ID number in here. Then we have the the packaging or the encapsulation. Um, 
um, and this allows us allows the tag. Um, it pretty much encases the tag, and it pr prevents the chip from being damaged, and also the antenna from being damaged. Um, it's pretty much either glass or plastic that protects the semiconductor inside. So that's what a tag is comprised of. Very simple. But it has a lot of applications, as I will get into. So how do these little tags work? Um, so let's talk about the communication between the reader and the tag. The power is received by the antenna from the reader uh, it in passive tags. Um, and this power activation, this power activates the tag and it starts the circuit inside and encodes the unique ID into the return signal. Okay. So this tag um, provides the power, it turns the tag on, and then um, the ID number is sent back to the reader. This signal is later transmitted back to the receiver when the unique ID is needed, as I just said. So as you can see, here's a communication between the reader and the tag. So there are also different ways of transmitting the power. Um, there are different ways of transmitting power between the reader and the tag by the antenna. The first one I'll talk about is near field transmission, which is only a few, few inches um, where the tag can get the power. And this is using, um, using magnetic induction to send power, also, al also known as alternating magnetic field. And the second way is far fuel transmission, which has a bit better range, um, up to 20 feet in range. And this uses propagating electromagnetic EM waves to transmit power. Um, this is used to send data back to the receiver, or to send data back to the receiver, low modulation is used in near field transmission. Both of these ways are um, of transmission uh, also have very low power consumption. So here is the picture, let's make it bigger, of what actually goes on during this power transmission. So here is our reader um, and it transmits, transmits, it produces a wave basically right here and this wave is intercepted by the RFID tag um, and then it's used to power a circuit and actually turns the tag on and then later this this um, the unique ID is sent back to the RFID reader and the unique tag is identified by the reader basically okay so let's look at how near field coupling works RFIDs tends to operate in low modulate in low frequencies in the range of 125 to 134 kilohertz for near near field transmission. Tags used a low modulation technique. The range is limited, however. This limitation resides in the physical formula d equals c over 2 pi f, where d is the distance or the range, c is the speed of light constant. 2 pi is also a constant, and f is the frequency where the tag operate the tag operates under. So we can, as we can see, um, as the frequency increases, the distance between the tag and the reader decreases, and that's why low frequencies have to be used in this technique. For near field coupling. Um, also, some of the properties of electromagnetic magnetic fields. Um, these two approaches give us two. Well, this approach gives us two different equations. So this is for magnetic field, where H is the magnetic field strength, and B is the mag um, B is the magnetic flux density. I'm sorry. So H, um, the first is calculate the magnetic field strength, and the second is magnetic flux density, yes. The magnetic field strength um, is I 
which is the current, times n, the number of coils, over 2 times the radius of the coil. And the magnetic flux density is calculated by this equation, the magnetic field strength, times mu, which is the coefficient of magnetic flux. So just a little inside of the physics that go on. Um, for far, far field coupling based design, more range is um, accomplished and a different approach is also taken. This approach is called far field transmission. It uses electromagnetic or EM fields for this transmission. It operates on high frequencies and allows tag to be read from a greater distance. So here's the electromagnetic field that is produced by the reader. And um, this field basically gets intercepted by this tag. It creates a circuit through the tag. And then using load modulation, um, it spits out the unique ID number um, to the reader after that. So more far, far field coupling, a tag captures these waves coming from a dipole antenna of the reader. We can use load modulation for that as I, as, as I just talked about. Uh, instead, we use backscattering. Okay, so we can't use load modulation. We have to use backscattering. The range is the range is limited by the amount of energy that reaches the tag and the sensitivity of the reader. The typical range is up to 20 feet, as I described earlier. So for greater range than that, um, we could use CMOS transistors and they operate under lower power and therefore they could operate at a greater distance since less power is needed um, to reach them in order for them to operate, right? So here's a picture of a CMOS transistor that's placed inside the tag. So how do these physics actually apply? So in our case, the reader produces the magnetic field which starts the current in the coil of the tag, as I said, and this turns, this in turn activates the tag or turns it on. Um, there are basic, these basic principles are principles that RFID tags operate on. I won't spend too much time on physics and how this stuff works because it just gets more complicated as I go on. So now let's look at um, identification numbers on the tag. Identification numbers are usually generated by a computer and then sent to the reader to be put into a tag. The unique identification numbers can be transmitted from a reader slash receiver to a RFID chip. When the reader requests that number from the tag, it activates the tag and turns and the number is sent back to the reader. The reader then sends, sends it to a computer when that data is handled into a database, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. And in that database, the ID is associated with a certain information, uh, whatever that tag belongs to. Um, IDs are s searched, organized, changed, and whatever you want to do with them in that database. So as you can see, um, here's the wave stream of RFID, tag, RFID tags come in. Um, on an actual chip of the RFID tag, um, it's kind of each, each um, section of the tag has a specific purpose. So the first eight bits or so of the tag store the tag version number. Then the next 28 bits store the domain ma manager the next 24 bits store the object class, and the last 36 bits actually contain the unique identifier. So of a to this is a total of um, 96 bits um, that uh, RFID tag is comprised of. 
But how is the ID actually transmitted onto the tag? Well, this can be done using two different methods. Either the ASK, also known as the amplitude shift keying, and then the BPSK, the binary phase shift keying. Um, for this, you kind of have to know a little bit about waves. So for a little review, from peak to peak is the wavelength. Um, this would be the amplitude of the wave or the height of the wave, you could sometimes call it. Um, and this should be enough to get my point across. So the ASK, the amplitude shift keying method is a type of modulation that is the easiest to use of the two methods. Um, shifting amplitude of the wave. This, this is a shifting amplitude of the wave. Large amplitude waves represent one. So as you can see here, this would be one, 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 one. And low, low amplitude waves represent a zero, 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 zero. The different combinations of the two produce different numbers or the unique uh, ID numbers of the tag. However, some noise, some extra noise could be a factor for error to occur since it could interfere with um, other signals, basically. So that's why a BPSK method is used more often. BPSK is the binary phase shift keying modulation that has been more successful than the ASK, as I just described. Um, it's easier for a reader to distinguish a one from a zero, basically, um, using this method than the ASK. We can, we can form different sets of waves by flipping the wave 180 degrees um, when we want a one and we keep it the same for zero. So with different combinations, we can uh, represent unique IDs once again. So over here, we could see, here's just a no normal wave of, I guess, all zeros. But here we could see one full wave is zero, zero, zero. But then over here, the wave is flipped, so it represents a one. So you get one, 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 and then back to zero, zero, zero. Uh, with this scheme, one is called the mark frequency and zero is called the space frequency. So let's talk about the strings of ID numbers. With either technique used, long strings of combinations can be made to create a unique ID number in each tag or chip. These tags have about 96 bits of storage, which is a small number from our perspective, but it can, it can create 12 times 10 to the 17th unique codes. This means we can have that many different items that can be uniquely identified. Well, this might be enough for now, but we might need more in the future. So here's different combinations of zeros and ones to represent one item. There are, however, some problems with RFIDs in general. Um, for one, the interference, the, there is interference issues in, in the link between the reader and the tag. There is sometimes metal obstructing the connection or other radio frequencies that are produced by other objects can interfere with the connection and it can block the signal. Um, the second problem would be the cost of the reader. Each reader is about a thousand dollars on average, we could be, which could be actually a pretty heavy cause for some people. Also, the cost of the tags could be a problem, where each tag has a cost of between five to forty cents per tag, depending on the style and the quantity of tags. So let me talk about the interference between the waves a little bit. There is what's called the destructive interference in which when the two different types of waves combine, there is no wave, or it's as if there was no wave produced. So this is one interference that um, RFID tags run into. And then there's also the constructive interference, 
which when the tags have the exact same or when the waves have the exact same um, amplitude then they can construct to a bigger wave which also can cause the reader to misread the tag okay now there are also other problems with RFIDs another problem resides in the speed and the quality of the computers used with RFIDs when tags are used a massive massive mass of data is coming from the reader and the database all at the same time these computers have to handle that plus identify each ta what each tag represents they must filter that data they must analyze it and organize it and convert it to a presentable to be presentable to the public this re really takes a powerful machine so that is also a great cause cost for businesses is to buy that powerful machine. Um, so let's talk about the uses of RFIDs today. Here I'll talk about the different applications. RFIDs have a great variety of applications, and this application, this application, and their application possibilities are still growing. So this really is what makes RFIDs so successful is this great variety of applications for just one idea. It's the same thing, but just used s in so many different ways. So in businesses, tracking merchandise, for example, in all stages of its process between the manufacturer and the consumer. So when a, when a certain object is produced, it is tracked from there all the way to where someone buys it. Then also they're used for personal use, so like in cell phones, pets, you can track your pets. Um, they're also used in biking, running, and swimming competitions to track the runners or the competitors inside those competitions. They're also used in airport luggages to track your luggage. Um, the government also uses them for bridge and freeway toll booths um, when someone has to pay a certain toll they have an RFID e some people have RFIDs in their cars um, let's say like the easy pass or the fast track that we have nowadays and this actually this is actually used um, very efficiently so people don't have to collect money at, at those places it's also used in credit card readers in supermarkets, as I described in the very beginning of my presentations. It's also used for security entrances and tracking trains and train cargo and many more. It's also used in farming when tracking herds of animals like cows, sheep, and goats. So let me focus on one specific application of RFIDs which is running. So how, are, how is running related to RFID tags? Well, runners have been, uh, been running races for hundreds of years, and it has always been as hard, it's always been hard to keep them, uh, to keep track of people uh, and their finishing times. In the 1990s, RFIDs solved this issue by giving each runner an RFID tag and attaching it to their to their shoe. They are lightweight and small, so they are easy t for runners um, to carry, and they're very convenient. This comes in, um, these tags also come in different forms. Uh, as you can see, there's thousands of runners here, and each one of them has to be uniquely identified. It's a tough task, to, tough task to accomplish, but that's why we we must appreciate RFID tags so much. So the two different types, um, these tags can be disposable, but also some races um, want them back because of their costs. Um, you know, each tag is between five to 40 cents, but that cost adds up. So that's why um, race managers want to get those tags back so they can reuse them for other races. Um, and those tags could either be attached on runner's shoes or they can actually be placed on the bib numbers um, during the race.
Okay, so now let's look at the readers of RFID tags. The readers are in the forms of these mats, um, and they are actually placed um, one at the starting line of the race and one at the finish line. The one at the starting line keeps track of when the specific ID has started or has crossed that mat, and the finish um, and the finish reader records the finishing time of that ID tag. Um, you then subtract the two to get the total moving time. So as you can see, this runner is going to cross this mat and in the, and then extract that unique ID number that that um, person holds or that that tag holds about that person, I guess I should say. Um, sometimes in really long races, Readers are also placed throughout the race or the course, and they usually every mile marker. And this is to determine each mile split. This also takes care of cheating in races because an individual would have to cross every mile marker between the start and the finish, and still, you know, keep up with everyone else. So now let's talk about the database in running. So the database in running is a form uh can take various it can take various amounts of forms but um the runners will then receive their finishing times that are stored um based on each tags as well as um they are stored in that database each id tag correlates to a specific runner and then their time is recorded the results are then or ordered by finishing times, but as you can see here, but they could also be um, separated in various ways um, and in various categories. So let's say you want all the male runners, so you could just display the male runners, or you want the female runners, you just display the female runners, or you can organize all this data in age groups also as you can see here, age division. So different stuff you could do with this data after it's all been recorded in the database. Um, so now let's look at some future uses of RFID tags. RFIDs uh, are also being implemented in big corporations such as Walmart, Tesla, Tesco, and US DOT, and Metro AG. These companies have the money to experiment experiment with this new technology, but it is a risk that they are taking. However, if this risk works, it will make their businesses much better and more efficient than others out there. So that's why they are willing to take that risk. So Walmart in specific, let's talk about that. Walmart in particular wanted to make their businesses run more efficiently by using RFID tags to tag their merchandise. This would solve a lot of problems. This would make it easier for the owner to identify all their items in the store. It would make it easier on the customer to find what they are looking for inside the store. It would make the lines for checkout a lot shorter because it would eliminate all the individual scanning. And also it would already help with security when somebody is trying to steal an item. So a bunch of different ways that RFIDs can help. So in conclusion, I hope that you have a general, good general overview of RFID tags. Uh, I have described what RFID tags are and what they are used for. Also, I've described some, some of the parts they are needed in order to work. Some parts like the, um, the reader, that database application and the actual database itself. They also need power to operate, um, which is either by either um, supplied by a reader or the power source. I also described what they are used for, some various applications. I've also described where they came from and some of the history that I've talked about. Uh, I've also looked at some different types of RFID tags, like passive and active tags. And I've also described how they work. Um, 
then I've also looked a little bit into where they are going in the future and where you can see them in the future, like Walmart, Tesco, and other stores like that. So in conclusion, I hope that you now see how important they are and why it's so important to know about them. It's good to get a good idea of what they are and how they work because you will see a lot more of them in the future as their application is still being is still developing and more applications are being found for these RFID tags. So now let me present a little short video um, about how RFID tags might be used in the future. Forgot your receipt. Check outlines. Who needs them? Have a nice day. This is the future of e business. So, as you saw in this IBM commercial, these RFID tags are being used in many different ways. So, it might have been hard to see, but they're actually used. Um, to identify each type of item um, so that person knew exactly where that item was. Then it was also used during the checkout process where the reader, the two big panels, actually scanned all those items and added them all up and uh, produced a total. And then what was kind of hard to see was I'm guessing that person also had a certain like a visa card or something where that was automatically scanned and paid for all those items um, so all this was done using RFID tags and it just made that checkout process so much simpler than what we have now well that's all I have to say about RFID tags for now um, please let me know if there are any questions and I'll be happy to answer them thank you for listening and have a good day